Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we're glad that you have joined us this week for our midweek message. Um, as we get rolling here, I want to welcome you to our YouTube channel here at Grace Life Bible. If you haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell so that you can stay current with our ministry here, uh, that would be much appreciated as we continue to build uh, an online audience and try to provide uh, good, rightly divided, relevant content for you week to week. So again, we want to welcome you here to our YouTube channel. Our featured book for the month of November is my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bullinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. And this book is about um, Bollinger's life and ministry and how Bollinger started out as a what I would consider a mid-axe dispensationalist and then how over time he drifted and ultimately embraced the uh, Acts 28 dispensational point of view. This book covers that. It also covers some things about the postscript theory about Romans 16 uh, verses 25 and 26 and how that factored into uh, Bollinger's reassessment of the book of Romans after he embraced the Acts 28 view. So if you're interested in the history of dispensationalism, if you want to know about uh, a very important figure in the, the history of dispensationalism, you're definitely going to want to pick up a copy of this book from Dispensational Publishing House. It's also available in Kindle, and there will be a link to this in the description underneath this video. And before we get rolling here, I also want to remind you about our Rumble channel. For those of you that are into alt tech sites, we've established this Rumble channel here. We're up four subscribers from where we were last week at this time. So I appreciate those of you who have subscribed and joined our uh, ministry here on Rumble. We established this earlier in uh, 2021 as an alt tech site to YouTube should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So we continue to upload content uh, to this from Sunday morning and midweek. Uh, the, re the recent rebroadcasting of the Grace History Project, as of now, there are no plans to put that on Rumble. But we'll have to see how things go. But as of right now, something there's not enough time in the day to do everything, and so uh, we're electing not to do that at this time. But check this website out on Rumble if you're into alt tech sites. Please consider subscribing to that. So in this video, what I want to talk about is the two streams of Bibles model or paradigm of preservation slash transmission. So those of you that know anything about the uh, the King James, the pro King James position you have no doubt seen charts like this, where you have a the two streams of Bibles, you have a pure stream, and then you have a corrupt stream, and everything is synthesized in this in, when it comes to this topic into a corrupt stream, a pure stream, and, and all the data, all of the relevant documents and so forth are sifted into this. And so there's a pure stream that comes out of Antioch according to this view, and then there's a corrupt stream that comes out of um, Alexandria, Egypt, according to this view. And so there are different manifestations of this. This is one, and here's a popular one that you may have seen on social media and on the internet. The idea of there being a providential line of preservation, the traditional text line, and the Alexandrian text line, and how everything is fitting into um either one of these two streams. So we're calling it the two streams of Bibles, okay? Now over here, you can't see, I probably have somewhere between 30 and 40 volumes in my personal library at home that are simply devoted to the issues of um, the King James Bible and defending it against over and against modern versions and the critical text. The books vary. Some are pro-traditional te pro text, Pro Texas Receptus. Others are very much King James only. I have a wide variety of different literature in my library here at home on these different subjects. All of them that are pro King James adopt some type of reasoning along a two, a two streams model of transmission or view of preservation. Okay. So I cut my teeth in the King James on the Bible version issue, reading material that was very much um, two streams of Bibles oriented as far as its explanation of how preservation and transmission were accomplished. Okay. Now, for those of you that don't know, I am involved or engaged in the church in a multi-year study, and that's found in this class right here from this generation forever, a study of God's promise to preserve his word. We're engaged in a multi-year study of 
inspiration, preservation, canonicity, transmission, and translation. And right now, this past Sunday, I taught lesson uh, 155 on the Hampton Court Conference and the attendees of the Hampton Court Conference. So we've gone very deep into this, and there's a ton of content and material for you to check out here if you're interested in learning more. But one of the things that I covered was an evaluation about whether or not the two streams of Bibles model of preservation slash transmission is accurate. Is it true? Does it, does it pass the test of scrutiny, if you will, okay? Now, I'm just going to be upfront, okay? I don't believe that it does, and I believe I have very good reasons for why I don't believe that it does. However, that does not mean that I am no longer a traditional text or King James advocate. I still am. I am not a critical text or modern version advocate because I view and understand those texts to be substantively different from the traditional text and the King James. In other words, they alter, they're altered in their doctrinal substance of what they are communicating. Okay. So what one thing that has that has uh, definitely struck me um, is that in the pro King James space, there's not a lot of nuance. Okay, you're you're either all this way or all that way, and if you say something that seems like it's out of the the traditional lane, then a lot of people start to question. Well, do you really believe the King James Bible? Are you taking up for modern versions? Are you abandoning the traditional text for the modern critical text? And the answer to that is no, I'm not. In fact, what I'm after is trying to enunciate and define a clear, reasonable articulation of a pro-King James position and a pro-preservation position that is devoid from a lot of the things that have been said that I think are just flat out wrong, that are demonstrably not true, and that I think really have uh, uh, hamper the position. One of those things is this two streams of model, two, two streams of Bibles model of preservation slash transmission. And I've been seeing in social media lately a lot about this. And so I wanted to make a video addressing this briefly and then directing people to where they can do a more thorough and in-depth study and investigation of the stuff that I have looked at as it relates to this topic. So suffice it to say, I started out fully embracing the two streams of Bibles model of preservation transmission. There are videos, teachings, audios, notes on the gracelifebiblechurch.com website where you will see me teaching it that way. However, in the last three or four years, more research and more data has caused me to question strongly whether or not that two streams of model approach and understanding of preservation slash transmission is correct. So what I want to do in this video is I want to show you two examples. We're just going to look at two. We can look at a whole lot more, but we're only going to look at two. I'm going to ask some questions after I've shown you the examples. We're going to have a talk, and then I'm going to direct you to where you can find out more about this. Okay. So one of the places that uh, pro-King James believers like to go to establish a textual difference between the traditional ecclesiastical Byzantine text or the majority text now, I understand those word, those terms are, are, are parsed and can be parsed out. I'm just using them in their most general sense, okay? One of the places that people like to go to establish a textual difference between the Greek text backing the King James Bible and the Greek text backing modern versions is Mark chapter 1, verse 2. So here we have it in the King James. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall pre prepare the way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now you'll notice here that in the King James, it says prophets, plural. And then Mark proceeds to quote two different prophets. He quotes Malachi and he quotes Isaiah. And so the, the traditional text and therefore the King James, which is a translation of the traditional text, the Textus Receptus, says prophets, plural, because that's what the underlying Greek says. And the underlying Greek says that because there's a citation here from two different prophets, from more than one, specifically Malachi and Isaiah. Now, we like to compare that often to um, modern versions. And here we have the verse in the NIV. As it is written, Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Now, so notice that this is singular. It says Isaiah the prophet. 
The King James in the traditional text said Isaiah, sorry, as is written in the prophets, plural. Here we have Isaiah the prophet, singular. Now, the reason it says that in the NIV is because that's what how it reads in the critical text. It reads Isaiah the prophet. It's a singular statement in the critical text, whereas in the traditional text in the King James, it's a plural statement, as it is written in the prophets. So then we have here the citation here from Malachi 3.1, and then we have verse 3, a voice, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And that's from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Okay, so, but you'll notice that the reading here is singular. But the first part of the citation isn't from Isaiah, it's from Malachi. So this is a common example that people will use to say, well, why would it say Isaiah the prophet if it's a citation from both Malachi and Isaiah? And this is often pointed out as an error in the critical text and therefore in the NIV. Okay, The ESV says something, does basically the same thing, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. So again, we see singular Isaiah the prophet, not prophets plural, as it is in the King James and the traditional text. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Okay. So now I ask you a question. For those of you that are advocates and defenders of the, the, the King James Bible, is there a difference between prophets and Isaiah the prophet? And I am sure that most of you listening to me right now would take the position and would say, that this is wrong. When it says Isaiah the prophet and not prophets plural, you are probably going to say that this is wrong. Now, you need to know that there is the pro critical text modern version crowd does try to salvage this. They acknowledge that their reading it seems to be off base because it's a citation of both Malachi and Isaiah, and so they will talk about first century quotation practices in Jewish literature for a reason why their their reading isn't wrong, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into all of that. I have right here an appendix, a 10-page appendix, raising and dealing with questions, response to questions raised during the teaching of Lesson 10 regarding Mark 1 and 2, and this is from Sunday, December 6, 2015, where I get into all of that. So I'm going to put a link to this in the description, okay? But here's the thing. If you're a King James advocate, you're going to say that prophets, the prophet Isaiah is not a correct reading because it's a quotation from two prophets. All right. Now, that is my position. That's what I argue here in this paper that I have on the screen, that I, that the prophets plural reading of the traditional text in the King James is the correct reading and that a problem is caused by the critical text and the modern versions here when they read as they do. OK. And I'm going to commend this to you to read. Now, but here's the thing. Why am I bringing this up now in a video where I'm talking about the two streams of Bibles? So one of the things that I did when I wanted to look into the two streams of Bibles, I had always just accepted the two streams of Bibles as true without doing any kind of Berean test on that. In other words, I didn't search out whether or not it was so. It was repeated. It was repeated. It was repeated. It was repeated. It was in book after book after book, lesson after lesson after lesson, preaching after preaching message after message that I had heard. And so I just said, well, I just thought to myself, well, then that means the people that are promoting this, they had to have checked it out. And so I just sort of accepted it in an uncritical way. But then I started looking around. OK, and one of the things I did is I well, let me I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to go back to this diagram. OK, now you'll notice something about this diagram in the pure stream. You'll notice they have the Old Latin, the Old Syriac, or the Peshitta, and the Old Gothic are in the pure stream. So all, without fail, almost all of these two streams of Bibles, charts and diagrams that you'll see, place the Syriac, the Peshitta, and the Gothic in the line, in the pure stream, in the line of the King James Bible, and the, the quote, pure stream, according to these charts, okay? So when I wanted to investigate all of this, one of the things I did is I said, okay, well, I'm going to try to find, can I find anything out about the Gothic? Can I find anything out about the Peshitta? Can I look at any of the readings? And, and if I can, what kind of conclusions can I come to if I'm able to look at the readings myself? 
So lo and behold, there is a website called the Ulfius Project, named after Ulfius, who translated the Gothic Bible. And we can go and we can look at Mark chapter 1, verse 2 in the Gothic Bible. And I can't read Gothic, but I know that that's a proper noun because it's capitalized. And I know because I can look it up in a, in a Gothic English dictionary that this says Isaiah the prophet. This reads and agrees with the ESV and the NIV. Now, but yet it's in the pure stream of Bibles on all of the two streams of Bibles, diagrams, and charts. So I now have a problem because I cannot remain consistent and say that the the Gothic Bible is in the pure stream when the Gothic Bible contains a reading that most King James Bible believers view as a corruption or a mistake or an error. So how can I place the Gothic Bible solely in the pure stream of transmission if it has a reading that I would not accept from an NIV, an ESV, or the critical text? Do you see the problem? There's a problem here. So this is what this is the first thing that I looked at as I was uh, considering this. So here it is. You can see, in fact, the Ulfius Project website shows you the Gothic, it shows you the Greek, and it shows you the English of the King James. And you can see that there's a clear contradiction between what the King James English has and what the Gothic had. Now, where'd the Gothic reading come from? Well, it had to be a translation out of a text that had Isaiah the prophet and not prophets plural. So if I'm going to reject the NIV and the ESV on the basis of it's saying Isaiah the prophet, but then I see that in the Gothic Bible it says the same thing, but yet on my diagrams of the pure stream I have the Gothic Bible. Why would I accept an unpure reading in the stream, in the pure stream of transmission when I would not accept it from an NIV or an ESV? Do you see the problem here? Okay, there is a definite glaring problem. Now the thing is. So let's look at this. So when I first did is I, I got a copy of this book right here. It's a big, thick book. It's, this is the um, Gospels, Gothic, Anglo-Saxon, Wycliffe and Tyndall versions arranged in parallel columns with preface and notes by Joseph Boswell. And the first passage that I checked is the one in Mark 1-2 to see if it read Isaiah the prophet, as in the critical text in modern versions, or prophets, as in the Texas Receptus and the King James. And based upon what I had been led to believe by reading King James only literature, what I found, it troubled me. I'm just being honest, because what I found was an agree, a supposed Bible in the pure stream agreeing with the stream of corruption. So what is this Bible doing here is what I started asking myself. The extant copies of the Gothic Bible contain a, contain a corrupt critical text reading of Mark 1-2, one of the hallmark passages utilized by King James advocates to quickly discern the textual basis of a given modern version. And the Gothic Bible is supposedly, quote, pure textual witness. According to the two streams of Bibles paradigm, I found a corrupt reading in Mark 1-2. This should not have been the case, according to the prevailing two streams of Bibles orthodoxy in the King James only movement. So I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, when I saw this, I about fell out of my seat because this was not this was not in agreement with what I've been led to believe. And in fact, Gail Ripplinger, one of the lead, so-called leading lights of the King James only movement, says... In her History of the Bible and Erasmus in the Received Text, Volume 2, 500 to 1500, says the Gothic Gospels are amongst the oldest of the vernacular virgins, versions match the text of Erasmus and the King James. Well, that's certainly not true in Mark 1, 2. So Gail Ripplinger would never tolerate that reading in Mark 1, 2 from an NIV or an ESV, yet she's telling you in her book that it's in agree. It matches the text of Erasmus in the King James Bible. You can go a little further in, in, in that same book. She quotes from the Cambridge History of the Bible. And I'm going to go down to this to, just to show you this in parallel columns in the section of these notes called Repudiating Ripplinger. Notice this is her citation of the, of the Cambridge History of the Bible, Volume 2. The original Greek manuscript or manuscripts from which Ulfius made his translation of the Gothic Gospels belongs to the Byzantine group. Then she inserts in brackets King James Version type. As in the Gospels, the original text of the epistles was of the Byzantine type and differs little from the fully developed Textus Receptus of the later period. Now, notice that she has engineered this reading, and this is what Cambridge actually said. 
The original Greek manuscript or manuscripts from, with, from which Ulfius made his translation uh, of the Gothic Gospels belong to the Byzantine group with a sprinkling of Western readings. Gail Ripplinger left that out. And not only did Gail Ripplinger leave that out, she inserts right here into parentheses King James Version type, misleading the reader. Because now when I go and I look at the very book that Ripplinger recommends, I find the woman taken in adultery missing from the Gothic Bible. I find the blood of Christ, as we'll see in a minute, from Colossians 1.14, missing from the Gothic Bible. I find it reading um, Isaiah the prophet in Mark 1.2 and a bunch of other issues that we can check in the Gothic Bible. But yet we're told on King J on pure streams of Bibles, charts and diagrams that the Gothic Bible is in the pure stream, and yet there's readings in the Gothic Bible that Gail Ripplinger would never tolerate from an NIV or an ESV or the critical text, yet she's telling you in her books that they're essentially the same and they match the, they match the text of Erasmus and the King James Bible. Folks, if you don't see that that's a problem, I'm not sure what else to say. You can't have... You can't have that level of subterfuge and be taken seriously when you're talking about these matters. Now, let's just look at one more example. And again, the notes that I'm going to leave in the description and the playlist are going to go way deep on this for you if you're interested in going there. Let's look at Colossians. I alluded to this a moment ago. Let's look at Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, some of you already know where I'm going with this. If you look at this verse in the NIV, in the ESV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What's missing? What's missing is through his blood. It's missing in the ESV, and it's also missing in the NIV. So why is it missing in the ESV and the NIV? The reason it's missing is because the underlying Greek text, the modern critical text, does not have through his blood in those verses. Okay. Now, again, if you read James White and um, those who are defending the uh, modern critical text against the traditional text in the King James, they have reasons that they give for this. I'll try to put a link to this in the description for this video either about harmonization and parallel influence and how well it's in Ephesians chapter one. So it doesn't need to be in Colossians chapter one and how no doctrine has changed because it's there. The, the, to me, all of that is neither here nor there, did the Colossians need that phrase when this epistle was originally sent to them? And does it matter if the blood of Christ is in that verse or not in that verse? Well, I, I think it matters. I think it's a textual issue, and I think it matters, and that it impacts the, the doctrinal substance of what Colossians 1.14 is teaching, whether or not you have the blood of Christ there or the blood of Christ not there. And I know that many of you would agree with me, but guess what? When we go to look at Colossians 1.14 in the Gothic Bible, now, again, I have done research and dug into this. What we find is that the expression through his blood is missing from the Gothic Bible. If you look at my notes, next, uh, here we are, perplexed. So this was after I looked at Mark 1-2. Perplexed, I decided to look at Colossians 1-14 to see if the blood of Christ had been taken out of the Gothic Bible. According to a Gothic English dictionary, the Gothic word for blood is blop. I, I don't know if that's, I don't speak Gothic. I don't know if that's right. My examination revealed that the blood, blop and Gothic of Christ in Colossians 1.14 is missing from the extant copies of the Gothic Bible. In its current textual state, the Gothic Bible agrees with modern versions in this verse, yet we are told in King James only literature without any qualification or explanation that it is pure, that's the Gothic Bible, that it's pure and, and uncorrupted and even on par or matching the King James Bible like we just saw there from Ripplinger. Yet when we actually look at it, we see that the, the blood is missing from the verse. The same as it is in the ESV, the same as it is from the NIV, both versions that people who are pro-King James advocates would say are corrupted by, by the phrase blood being, through his blood being missing from those verses. Yet on all the two streams of Bibles, charts, diagrams, and etc. The Gothic Bible is in the pure stream when it contains readings in its, in its extant status that they would not accept as pure. What is going on? Okay. Now somebody could say, well, um, those are the extant copies, extant meaning existing. Um, the original 
Gothic Bible agreed with the King James. To which I would just simply say, if you're going to go that route, that's no different from a modern critical text advocate doing the same thing about the original manuscripts. You don't know, you don't have the original Gothic Bible. Anything you're going to say is complete speculation, and all we can do is go off the extant surviving available copies where we do see non non-traditional readings in the extant copies of the Gothic Bible. So how can this be accurate then when the Gothic Bible is in the pure stream, yet it contains readings that people view as corrupt down here? And it is also missing the woman taken in adultery. It is, there are more problems with it than what I'm covering here. And if you want to know that information, I'll tell you how to find more out about that before this video is over. But look, folks, the same thing is true for the Peshitta. So we can look at the Peshitta, and here it is. It's in the pure stream. The old Syriac is a reference to the Peshitta. And we can look at these verses and the extant witnesses to, to the Peshitta. And we can see Mark 1, 2. The Eldridge, the Eldridge version says, uh, Isaiah the prophet, the Murdoch version, Isaiah the prophet, the Lanzma, Isaiah the prophet, the King James says prophets. So as we just observed last week with the Gothic, the Peshitta contains a critical text reading in Mark 1-2, a popular verse for easily discerning the textual basis of a given translation. Yet we are assured by Ray, J.J. Ray and, and Sorensen uh, authors, as well as other King James only authors, that the Peshitta was translated from an early form of the received text Yet in its extant witnesses, it contains a critical reading. So why then is it in the pure stream, giving you the impression that it's basically in complete agreement with the traditional text in the King James Bible? It's just not the case, folks. And we can look at the same thing in Colossians 1.14, the other example that I'm using in this video. Eldridge, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, by whom we have redemption and remission of sins, by whom we have attained salvation and forgiveness of sins, all three are missing the through his blood phrase. But yet again, the Syriac Peshitta is in the pure stream. So there are, there are Bibles in the pure stream that contain readings that a King James advocate would never accept from the critical text in a modern version. So I say to myself, how can the how can the two streams of how can the two streams of Bibles model be true? You cannot say, well, the original Peshitta, the original Gothic, they agreed with the King James because you you don't know. You are speculating in the same manner and in the same way that a modern critical text advocate does when they talk about the original autographs, which no one has seen a day in their life. So, I'm not making this video to. Um, shake the foundations of your faith. I'm asking this video to simply ask the question and say, can we have the conversation about whether or not the two streams of Bibles model is true? I don't believe it's true. I believe it's not the case that it is correct. And in fact, what I want to do, if I can find the right tile, is in my in the description for this video, I am going to share a link to this 98-page document that has all of my notes from, from this Generation Forever class when I taught on this issue, okay? I taught on this issue about five, six lessons on whether or not the two streams of Bibles model is true. It's in these notes, and I will also share a link to this playlist, the two streams of Bibles model of transmission, its origins and accuracy. And so this playlist here goes with these notes here. And I'm going to put the, both of these in the description under this video for you to check out and read through on your own time. Now, if the two streams isn't the way to think about it, and I still believe in preservation, and I still think the King James Bible is 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 what I should be using and reading in in, in English in my language, if that's the case, and that is the case for me then I have to have a different model. I have to have a different paradigm. I have to have a different way of explaining it that's more accurate than this two streams idea. So what I encourage you to do in the next week is this, okay? 
do some homework, read these notes, listen to the videos that go with them, watch the videos, listen to them with the notes, follow through. You can follow all through there as I teach all of that. And just be open to the idea of, is the two streams really the right model? Is it really correct? And then next week in my midweek video, I'm going to present to you an alternative model, an alternative way of thinking about it that I will that I think is a better, more sound, more doctrinally accurate way of thinking about the issue than the two streams. So I'd encourage you to check out all of this information. Now, before I go, I want to remind you, where, where am I at here, that you can get all this information and stay current also with the From This Generation Forever website and class, all right? I want to make a couple reminders. First, I want to remind you about my book, our featured book for the month of November, which is Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. You can pick this up from Dispensational Publishing House or the, the e version. There's a link in the description for that. I also want to remind you about the podcast that my wife and I are doing, Just Grace It, the Just Grace It podcast with Brian and Becky Ross. We rebooted this last week. And we made an episode explaining where we've been and why we hadn't done a podcast for two months. So if you're into that, check that out. We'd encourage you to do that. And just a reminder, we are rebroadcasting on this channel here, Grace Life Bible, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 a.m. We are rebroadcasting the Grace History Project. This is a project tracing the abandonment and resurgence of Pauline truth from Paul to the present exhaustive study of church history from a mid-Acts, Pauline, rightly divided point of view and perspective. If you haven't gone through the Grace History Project, you're going to want to do it. It's intense, it's in-depth, and for many that have reported to me over the years, it almost serves as a Grace apologetic. So look, folks, you got a lot of content on this channel. There's a lot of things for you to consider. You can really go deep if you want to go deep into these things, deep onto the study of preservation and the Bible issues, deep into the study of church history from a point of view of Pauline truth. And if you haven't done so, please like this video, leave a comment, share the video, share the channel, invite people into this uh, Grace History Project experience. Check out the teachings, read the notes, do your homework, and next week I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk to you about what is a better model than the two streams? If the two streams isn't the way to think about it, and I don't think that it is, and I document it and talk in length and detail about it, again, in these notes that go with this year, this playlist, please check that out. And before you leave, let me just tell you, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you have never relied exclusively on his death, burial, and resurrection as the only total complete payment for your sin, you need to do that today before it's everlasting too late. You need to acknowledge your sin before an almighty God. Acknowledge that you can't save yourself, that your own work, that your own performance is going to leave you short of the glory of God and already has left you short of the glory of God. Reach out in faith to a Redeemer who died for you, who paid the price, and who rose again, the victor over sin and death. If you believe and trust that today, you receive eternal life as a free gift. You'll be taken out from under the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And you will be made a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. Put your thinking caps on and do your homework. See you next time.